to Genesis chapter what? 39? 41. No, we didn't jump ahead. We finished 40 yesterday. We did two. Yep, yep. All right. 41. So, yes, 41 is where we're at. We finished 40 yesterday. We're at 41 today. We're missing three people from your row, Caitlin. Where is everybody? They're all sleeping? They all passed out? Hi. Ah. Uh, 99 monkeys jumping on the bed. One fell off and bumped his head. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Welcome here. I'm glad you guys are here. Are you guys ready to be here? How was your previous class with Ken? Was it good? Amazing. Really? Okay, good. Yeah? His fish analogy was sick? I don't know if I've heard that one. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I agree. That's a great analogy. That's called, uh, was it Pavlov's hierarchy of needs? This, the, this fish needs their oxygen intake more than they need the steak that we want them to eat. So they don't really care about the steak because they don't have the safety of like, being able to breathe. Like That's what Kiaru said that. You, oh, you know. get out of here. Man. I literally just made that pun. Get out of here. They don't like being dry either. Mm -hmm. um, also, just a thought for future uh, times, because we're talking about fish. Did you guys know that a fish in an aquarium is just a fish on a space station? <gasps> that is the fish version of a space station. It's an aquarium. So what's a man in the No, wait, can you say that again? A fish in an aquarium is just a fish in their version of a space station. Not in an accordion. I have never put a fish in an accordion, Matty Drake. You need to wake up. Dang it, did I say accordion? Yeah, no, 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 an aquarium is what I was supposed to say. A fish in an aquarium is a fish in a space station, yeah. Okay, we're going to, so fun story, this chapter of Genesis is 57 verses long. It is the second longest or longest chapter, hang on, I got to go to chapter 24 to see which one's longer. No, 24 is definitely longer by 10 verses. So it's the second longest chapter in the book of Genesis, as far as I can remember. Um, speaking of which, Genesis is the fourth longest book in the Bible. Fourth longest, yes. What is it? Jeremiah. Yeah. Well, it depends on how you're counting. Words. Words. In Hebrew. But then, if you calculate the amount of words in English or in Hebrew, it changes, which is a whole other conversation for a whole different day. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. You, there are lists that, that people have online, so you can just go look that up. It's Google longest books in the Bible by word. Okay. Let's pray, and then let's get into Genesis chapter 41. God, we are here because uh, we want to be. This is not a I have to do this. This is I get to do this. Um, and as we study your word in these moments, would you allow us to dig into the parts that matter to you? Because those are the important parts. Um, would we get stoked on the stuff that you're stoked on in here? In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we read the first verse of this chapter last time. Now it happened at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream. And we have that hyperlink of saying, well, wait a minute, we've had dreams before in this story, yes. We've also had dreams before in the book of Genesis. 
pay attention to that because I think that's probably our hyperlink for the day. He was standing by the Nile, and lo, now some of your translations are going to say, behold. Um, this is actually, in Hebrew, a change in perspective. So they're not saying this is no longer the narrator narrating for you. This is them being like, you are in Pharaoh's perspective looking at the thing he's looking at. Look, this is what's happening. Okay. From the Nile, there came up seven cows, and this is such a poor English, it's okay, sleek and fat. Anybody have a different translation of what that means? Yes. Attractive. What? Yeah. Well favored kind. Well favored kind. <laughs> attractive and plump. Attractive and plump. That sounds like a bird. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So the attractive word is the same word used of Joseph and of Rachel. Oh. Well looking. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> it's the same Hebrew word, same Hebrew root word. That's the word that we used for, you remember in Genesis 39 when Joseph was really handsome and, and fair of appearance? Or he was, yeah, right? He was pleasant to look at? That's these cows. These cows are pleasant to look at. Yep, same idea. And they grazed in the, this says marsh grass. We're going to call it a meadow. That's probably a more, we'll, we'll get that, yeah. Um, then behold, seven other cows came up after them from the Nile. Ugly and gaunt. Anybody know what the word gaunt means? Because I don't. I think it means like when you lo lose the fat and you see like the bones and the shape of your body. Okay. You're starving. Yeah, they're starving. <laughs> and they stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. So you've got 14 cows. No, no, wait. Yeah, 14 cows standing on the bank of the Nile. Pharaoh's standing there looking at them, right? I want you to put yourself in this dream because that's what the author is trying to do. Pretend you are Pharaoh looking at this dream. Yeah, here we go. And the ugly gaunt cows, that's going to be such a funny word the whole rest of my life, ate up the seven sleek fat cows. Then Pharaoh woke and he fell asleep and dreamed a second time. And behold, seven ears of grain came upon a single stock, plump and good. Yes. Is this the same night? We don't know. It might be a jump in the space-time continuum, or it might be the exact same night. All we know is that he added two dreams. Were they far apart? Um, what, what I tend to hear in that Medicaid is I remember when, uh, I think the scriptures talk about David waking up in the middle of the night and talking to his like scribe about something that he has thought of or dreamed or things like that. It was a normal thing for a king to have a servant that was just there to like write down the things that he dreamt about or things that he thought about while he was falling asleep. Yep. So it wasn't, they weren't necessarily in the room, but they were very nearby at all times and constantly on call while the king was sleeping. This sounds nice, doesn't it? Your phone actually will do that for you, but that's a whole other conversation for a whole other day. You could just be like, phone, write this down in a note, and then you just bleh, and then you go back to sleep. This is Pharaoh's version of that. And he fell asleep and dreamed a second time. But what we're supposed to see here is that Pharaoh has had how many dreams? Two. two. Oh, interesting. How many other times have we had people with two dreams? Joseph and Yep. The bacon and the... Yes. They are put together. So it's two people having two dreams in the same span. One's good, one's bad. Uh-huh. Oh, there's a lot of interconnectivity here, isn't there? Lots of theme hyperlinking. They're bouncing back and forth off of each other. We're supposed to compare them. Well, Keep comparing them. A second time, and behold, seven years of grain came up on a single stop. Seven, seven yes. So um, Nick had asked a question about numbers with me not in class. I would like to point out that numbers are hyperlinks, but numbers are not hyperlinks in themselves. So when you see a number hyperlink, don't be like, this automatically equates that, equates that other seven. That's not how this works. They are meant to point at each other saying, how are these things alike and how are these things different? Does that make sense? Because if we just say, this number means this, and this number, we turn into numerologists, and we're trying to like sort things out and, and do things without God and create knowledge for ourselves, which sounds scarily like the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, so let's not do that. Yes? OK, good talk. And behold, or look, seven ears, thin and scorched by the east wind, sprouted up after them. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump and full ears. Then Pharaoh awoke, and look, it was all a dream. 
No. Yes. Is there another wind in this story? Wind? wind? Or is that some other sort of mm. There are a bunch of places that wind shows up. Um, hey, someone want to look up on Blue Letter Bible what that, what that word for wind is? Oh, there's lots of. Oh, there's lots more. East. So, yeah, yeah. East and wind are both repeated several times over the course. East is everywhere in Genesis. That's a long story for a different day. Um, oh, I'm thinking of Jonah. That's what, that's thinking what you're thinking. Story. Yes, the east wind. Yep. Yep. Yeah, what's the east wind? That came from the east. Interesting. Scorched by the... Is it just say scorched by the east? Yeah, I think oh, the interesting. Most of the time. Yeah. What's the theme of the That's so... From this word. Um, to meet, Google, confront. Very interesting. So it's not an... Scorched by the east is what the direct translation is in Hebrew. Interesting. Blighted, blighted by the east. What comes from the east? A terrible something. Probably wind. Could be something else, but the, uh, the implication is east wind. Yeah. We get yeah we get vog from the east. It's not fun. <sighs> Verse eight. Now it came about. Hey, we have just fast-forwarded. In the morning, yet his spirit was troubled. So he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men, and Pharaoh told them his dreams. But there was no one who could interpret them to Pharaoh. Then the chief cupbearer spoke to Pharaoh, saying, I would make mention today of my offenses. Pharaoh was furious with his servants, and he put me in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard, me and the chief baker. And we had a dream on the same night. So this cupbearer is doing the wah -oh for us. You see that? He's like, I've made a grave error. And also, oh my gosh, Pharaoh, look at all these connections. Yeah? He and I, each of us dreamed according to his the inter own interpretation of his own dream. Yeah, I am. <laughs> now a Hebrew youth with us there, a servant of the captain of the bodyguard, we related it to him, and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each one he interpreted according to his dream. And it came about that just as he interpreted for us, so it happened. He restored me in my office, but he hanged him. Wild. Then Pharaoh sent and called for Joseph. They hurriedly brought him out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself and changed his garments, he came to Pharaoh. Oh, oh, oh. What? What? Not necessarily. So changing in garments isn't always deceiving. Do you remember in Adam and Eve's case when God makes clothes for them? That's not a deceiving moment. So garments can be used to deceive. But the theme is not always that garments equal deception. It's that garments connect to garments, connect to garments, to connect to garments. Right? The, uh, I am going to pull this out. Here we go. Whoop. Let's see if I can throw things on the ground. Whoop. Breaking things, losing things. We're all over the place this morning. OK. So hyperlinks. So hyperlinks are when the exact same word is used. Ah, uh, that was the opposite. Exact mm -hmm. word is used twice. This is um, not equal with themes. Themes are hyperlinked. Thoughts in a similar direction. Okay. 
we're probably going to keep going over these ideas for every other time that we get to talk together. And then we have motifs, which is several themes bouncing off of each other in one way or the other. Yes? The themes are not always, the themes are going to be the same as each other. When you see a theme, that is the same, right? So she saw that it looked good and took it for herself. That theme is always the same. It's not that it's she, but saw and took, that's the same theme. You're always thinking to yourself, oh my gosh, face palm. Someone is doing something really dumb and is about to bring a huge curse on themselves, right? That's a theme. But when, whenever you see the word saw, you don't think to yourself, oh no, what's going to happen? Because sometimes God saw something. That was the original saw hyperlink, is that God saw that it was good in Genesis chapter 1, right? Those two hyperlinks are contrasted, not equivalent, yeah? So here, when we, where were we just now? Uh, ah, the pit, and when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes. So, all the, do you guys, can you list for me all the mentions of clothes that you can think of in the book of Genesis? So the first one we had was what? Adam and Eve, but really it's God making clothing, right? So Jacob and Esau, that's like more like down here. Yes, Noah was uncovered, right? Um, who else gets clothed? Joseph. Joseph. Several times. Also, Judah. Also Judah. Judah, right? That's in here. Judah, Tamar. Who else? Un Mmm. Yeah, no, this is. is but also, so Rebecca showed up with a veil when she saw Isaac for the first time, and then Leah was covered up in a veil at her wedding day so that Jacob had no idea who she was. Mmm. See, are you seeing how these hyperlinks are pointing at each other, but they're not necessarily the same thing? Yes? And so there are different themes being created as you see the same hyperlinks going along. Yes? Yes, the idea of the use of the word, right? So there are several themes with the same hyperlink. Okay. So in this case, Joseph's clothes are changed because he has gone from being down, down, down. He's going up. Pharaoh is bringing him up into Pharaoh's court, right? And Pharaoh said to Joseph, 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 I have had a dream. But no one can interpret it. And I have heard it said about you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. There's a lot of interpreting going on. There's a lot of interpreting going on. Interesting. Joseph then answered Pharaoh, it is not me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable dream. This is the word Elohim again. Yes? Not the word Yahweh. Not the word, uh, what's the other one that they use so frequently? Oh, my gosh. El is a short for Elohim, but then there's another one. And it's escaping me, yeah, Yahweh, and then there's a fourth one. Uh, yes. Uh, there's a whole bunch that are used later, but like, yeah, there's only, there's only like four that are used in the book of Genesis. Um, and I am spacing on the last one, forgive me guys, that's my lack of sleep. Um, I don't have it written down anywhere. <sighs> the point being, this is Joseph just saying that the God that I know is going to give favorable, a favorable answer. Now, that favorable, what is that word? Anybody have their blue letter Bible open? It says answer of peace. Oh, answer of peace. Very interesting. What, else, what do your versions say? Every, anybody else has got a different? Um, I am looking at 16. Joseph then answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a 
Favorite oh. answer? The answer. Oh. Mm. The word is shalom. Oh. Completeness, soundness, like blessing or peace. Yes. Isn't that interesting? Now. Yep. Hmm. Okay, how come there's she'll give an answer and then there's no word and then there's So remember that Hebrew to English is not one for one. There are places where multiple Hebrew words explain one English word, or the inverse of that, where multiple English words are used to explain one Hebrew word. But what is it explaining then? Um <laughs> that's the adventure, right? So usually it will have an arrow pointing one direction or the other, or it will be um, kind of like a connecting uh, phrase because there are words in Hebrew that are pointing objects at verbs and verbs at objects without having any like direct correlation to the actual story being told. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. So here's, do you remember how we went through Genesis 39 and I said hand, even though the word was not hand in the English. The reason why I said hand is because the Hebrew word was the same word for hand every time. So when you have something that's different in a whole bunch of translations, usually it's because people are having a difficult time translating it or because there's a hyperlink that someone's like, this is a hyperlink, notice this. But there are other Bibles that don't care about the hyperlinks right? Translations of the Bible that don't care about hyperlinks because that's not the point they're trying to make in their translation. Like, so I know people don't consider the message like a translation. It's more like a, a paraphrase. His goal is not to say all of the words exactly the same as they are in Hebrew. Same with the NIV. The NIV is translating more like, like phrase for phrase than it is word for word. It's not a word for word translation. That's okay. That's a good thing. We need those things to compare against each other so that we can understand it better. Yes? Maybe that's why they use king versus pharaoh. Maybe. <laughs> the question oh, now, so, so when you look it up in the Hebrew, did you look it up on the Blue Letter Bible? And was it a different word for king than it was for pharaoh? Because I would wager it probably is because king in Hebrew is usually some version of melech. King was like to reign and pharaoh was like to be king of Egypt. Yes. But, so... Um, <laughs> Mm-hmm. So, hold on a second. Let me see what the word for Pharaoh is. We don't have to do this right now. Yeah, yeah. No, no. But it's important that we get the... It's interesting. Yeah. So, Pharaoh is Paro in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. It means great house. Yeah, great house, right? Whereas... The king of Egypt is, yeah, Malek, which is the same word that they use for king. So here's another funny, you ready for another, uh, yeah, another funnyism? Um, these words get used all over the place when you're not looking for them in the Hebrew. In the, like, so you, you see these like phrases get, like, Goodness gracious. Abraham going to visit Pharaoh twice in his story. They talk specifically about Pharaoh, and that's one of the hyperlinks that it's pointing to when they say Pharaoh. But they're also saying king of Egypt because there are a whole bunch of other places where Abraham, Isaac, they visit other kings. But what is a king in this day and age? Are there like formalized nations that have all of their documentation and this is the formal king and we're going, maybe, but also it seems like they were kind of just like the barbarian warlords that were in charge of their houses of like their, their spaces. That's more like what these people were. This wasn't like a necessarily a formal thing all the time. Abraham was like the king of Israel when he was, he was, he was the head of his household. So was Isaac, so was Jacob. It's interesting now that the favorite son of Jacob is now on par, well, visiting with the king of Egypt, right? 
These are two, well, it's a king and a prince hanging out and talking. But one, we don't, like, Pharaoh doesn't know that this kid's a prince. It's completely unaware because he's been brought down and down and down and down, right? He's not the, like, heir prince. That's Judah. But Joseph is this, like, son of the king of Israel. Or the, the, what the human ruler of Israel, right? God's technically the king. What I'm trying to say is, is that as humans would look at it, there is this, uh, yeah, rulership that is going on here that is being contrasted when we see the word king. But Pharaoh doesn't necessarily like automatically equate to us. That's like, like the name of the Egyptian king specifically, or not the name, the uh, title of the Egyptian king specifically, right? So I don't know why they interchange those. I would love to get to the bottom of that. It sounds like a great time and a lot of extra study. So I don't currently have time for that, but you might. I do. <laughs> okay. 17. So Pharaoh spoke to Joseph. In my dream, notice what we're doing right now. We are about to repeat a whole buttload of information that we already heard. Why? Look for differences. We're comparing it against the first version that we heard. Oh, you've already been looking ahead. Nick has been doing some work. What are the three differences, Nick? <laughs> um, it says the bank of the river instead of near the river. Hmm. Interesting that, oh, is that the English translation? Because in my translation, it says the bank on both sides. Mine says went out of the river and went out of the river. Huh. Interesting. Continue. Okay. Um, second difference. Um, after he's talking about the ill cows yeah. or whatever, yeah. such as I've never seen in all of Egypt. Ooh. That wasn't the same for badness, whatever. Yep. Where is that? Uh, when they had eaten, no, no one would have known that they were eaten. Hmm. Yeah, you couldn't tell. Ah, so there are some distinct differences that have been added in. Yeah, that's his opinion. Yeah. He also describes the tongues differently. Yes. Uh, he said gaunt, and then he uses scrawny and lean. Mm. Mine says the same. Interesting. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, no, in my version it says gaunt and ugly, and the next one says, yeah, uh, just, just as ugly as before. Gone, gone ugly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's read through just to keep our eyes peeled for other things that may hyperlink us to something important. You don't necessarily have to read, but listen carefully. In my dream, behold, I was standing on the bank of the Nile, and behold, seven cows, fat and sleek, or favorable face, came up out of the Nile, and they grazed in the meadow. And look, seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and gaunt, such as I had never seen in the, uh, for ugliness in all the land of Egypt. And the lean and ugly cows ate up the first seven fat cows. Yet when they had devoured them, they could not be, it could not be detected that they had devoured them, for they were just as ugly as before. Then I awoke. I saw also in my dream... Wait, is it the same dream? And behold, seven ears, full and good, came up on a single stalk. And look, seven ears, withered and thin, and scorched by the east, sprouted up after them. And the thin ears swallowed the seven good ears. Then I told it to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. Hmm? Mutation. What do you mean by that? Mm-hmm. It, the... Yeah, that one is a different dream, and he summarized a lot of things, right? Things that the author, or the uh, narrator told us about him. He didn't just talk to the magicians. Who else did he talk to? The wise men. The wise men. So the, apparently the narrator thought it important to mention in both in the first time and then summarize it the second time. He's consolidating the story. The author is, or the pharaoh is, and we're not sure which. Okay. Now Joseph said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dream or dreams are one and the same, which actually it's Pharaoh's dreams are one uh, and the same is an extra thing that, never mind, we'll get to that some other time. 
God has told us, told to Pharaoh, what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good years are seven years. The dreams are one. And the seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years. And the seven thin years scorched by the east shall be seven years of famine. It is as I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Mm. Mm-hmm. Also with Lot. Also, you will have nations come Yep. Also, I would like you guys to see that this right here is a chiasm, what we have just finished from Joseph starting talking to right where he stopped. He repeats. Oh, have we not talked? Do we not talk about chiasms? This is such a fun thing. Okay, okay, okay. Um. Uh, Will I break anything if I flip this thing? Is there space on this side? Can I flip this thing? Ah. I did the thing. Okay, chiasm. Yeah. Wait, I can spell. I can spell. Azum. Okay, this is the format chiasms take most of the time. Okay, so there's like a first statement where someone says something or something is talked about or there's this like theme or hyperlink pointed out. Then something different happens that's a completely different thought. Then a third thing happens and maybe even a fourth thing happens, but in this case it's actually just three. So we'll go like this, make it easier on us. I'm so sorry, I will get out of the way. I do have to write, but I can do that. Okay, A, B, C, B, A. It's a flying eagle. It's a flock of birds. It's a flock of birds. Flock of flying fish. What's that from? Ice Age? What? Sin? Sid. Yes, Sid. I was like, my hearing is going. Okay. So Pharaoh's dream, dreams are one. God has told Pharaoh what he's about to do. Which verse is that? 25. And 28. Yes? So, in between 25 and 28, what's happening? The seven good cows are seven years. Seven good years are seven years. The dreams are one. Seven lean, ugly cows that came up after the seven years. And, right? So, we've got God has shown seven years. What goes here? Something that's, not Something that's not repeated in that story, but is in the very middle. What is in the middle? Yes, the dream is one. We are at the point of inception, yes. You guys still can't see this. I'm sorry. This happens everywhere in the Bible. I actually have a Bible from 1932 that is like, basically it's the chiasm Bible and just takes all of the chiasms and analyzes them. You can look up on the internet. Hold on. I, have to, I don't even know if I still have it in my mind. Uh, there is a guy that went through the Bible and just pointed out every possible chiasm he possibly like, could through the course of the entire scriptures. It took him, I want to say 30 years. Like, like that was his like life's work. Was here are all the chiasms. Uh, look, look up like chiasms in the script uh, in the Bible, um, and there should be. It's actually really well thought out and really well designed. It's just a website. It's super simple. It's just white pages with words on it that show the chiasms and how they connect. Um, the fun part about chiasms is it's another way of expressing. Uh, themes and thoughts. The dreams are one. This is not the only place where we, we heard the dreams are one, but it is a place where a chiasm is clearly shown. Yes? You see how they're mimicking each other on the way up and on the way down? 
Why does this matter? It's a pattern used through scripture that will represent itself over and over and over again. They use this pattern to express important points in the scriptures. Yes. Oh, I get it. Oh. Used to express. Really important themes in the scripture, right? This one, God has shown you what he's about to do. He's, he said it twice. Seven years are happening on either side. The important point, Pharaoh, your dreams are one. They're one and the same. We're going to start in 29. Behold, look, seven years of great abundance are coming in all the land of Egypt. I want to say that word abundance is more like great blessing, but that's not for me to say. Go look it up for yourself. Great plenty. Great plenty, yes. And after them come seven years, uh, seven years of famine will come, and all of the abundance will be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine will ravage the land. Yes? I thought it went further than just Egypt. Hmm. We'll find that out later. Spoilers. Thanks, Medicaid. And the famine will ravish the land. So the abundance, or the blessing, will be unknown in the land because of the subsequent famine, for it will be very severe. Now, as for the repeating of the dream to Pharaoh twice, that, ma the, uh, that the matter is determined by God, that God will quickly bring it about. It sounds like you guys are finding hyperlinks of your own in here, then you're not telling me about what's going on. Well, I don't know if it's a hyperlink. It just is like the, it's explaining that mm -hmm. it's established by God and he's going to do it. Right. Forgotten. Forgotten. What do you mean forgotten? I mean hyperlinks. Like, uh, mm. Who is it? The cup for? Yep. Had forgotten. Mm. Yep. Ignored, forgotten, it's, right, it's the same idea as like when God remembered Noah, did God actually remember Noah, or is this thing of God was thinking about Noah and was going to come to his aid at that point in time? Right? It will be forgotten. It was like to mention. Mm-hmm. That was another word for Right, right. <sighs> okay. 33. So, now Joseph turns a corner. He goes from interpreting the dream to making a judgment call about this interpretation. Now, as for the repeating of the dream, oh, Pharaoh twice. No, we have to do that part. And now let Pharaoh look for a man discerning and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh take action, appoint overseers in charge of the land. Hmm. And let him exact a fifth of the land of Egypt in the seven years of abundance. Then let them gather all the food for these good years that are coming and store up grain for food in the cities under Pharaoh's authority and let them guard it or keep it. And let the food become as reserve for the land for the seven years of famine which will occur in the land of Egypt, occur in the land of Egypt, so that the land may not perish during the famine. Mm -hmm. Have we, has there been a famine any other time that we've read about in Genesis? I know that, that uh, Isaac was told not to go down to Egypt because of a famine. I know Abraham did go down to Egypt because of a famine. Interesting, yes? And now one of Abraham's descendants is already in Egypt to prepare them for this famine. Hmm. There's there's a lot of layers to that. Yes, Kate. So I feel like going back. Yes. Why is the why is the point in the what is that? Why yes. is the point in that the dream and not the interpretation of the dream? Um I don't know. Because in my head the interpretation of the dream will be more important than the dream itself. Because mm. it doesn't actually say the interpretation there. He doesn't say the interpretation there. Does it? Nope. Well, he does say seven years on either side. Well, that's what I'm saying. In verse like 29 through 32, mm -hmm. it says, doesn't he? But that's after it. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's what I'm asking. Why isn't it like that's a point instead of the dream? Maybe it could be. So here's where 
it becomes this race to figure out for yourself what is the scripture trying to do? Because the scripture's not trying to do, hey, all of your dreams that you dream twice mean the same thing. That's not the point of what the scripture's trying to do. But it is the point of what Joseph's trying to do to get Pharaoh to see what? This next section that he's about to explain. Right? It's one of the most challenging things in the scriptures is that we read the scriptures so often for what it's trying to say when we should be reading it for what it's trying to do. Because it says something, but that something is trying to accomplish something. Have we talked about this before? Yes? No? Maybe? No? We haven't talked about this before. Oh, we are getting to the gems right here. All language is one, relative, and two, propaganda. Every bit of language that I have ever tried to use with you has been trying to do something. Otherwise, I would not communicate to you if I did not mean to do something. Same with you. Whenever you try to communicate to anyone, you are trying to do something. You are not just trying to say something. With that in mind, what is this chiasm trying to do? The authors are creating layers upon layers upon layers of meaning, and all of it is trying to do something. It's not all trying to do the same thing, but it's all trying to do something. What? It's showing us a rhythm, that's for sure. But it's, again, it's not just trying to do one thing. Right now, Joseph is hearing Pharaoh's dream. It's when he hears these dreams and understands what they mean, at that point, would it be his prerogative as a descendant of Abraham to find a way to be a blessing for whatever God puts into his hand? Has God not just put the dreams of Pharaoh into Joseph's hand? Yes? He did. Whatever Joseph has in his hand that God puts there tends to prosper. So Joseph's going to be like, well, I've seen this pattern through the course of this. Now what do I do? What's my responsibility in this now that Pharaoh has put his dream into my hand? I better help him get out of this so that this thing doesn't get worse which is him living into what God has called Adam to do and what God has called Abraham to do, which is, I've called you to be a blessing to many nations. Your descendants will be a blessing on many nations. And unbeknownst to him, he can help a lot more than just people of Egypt. Mm-hmm. Is that a motif? That, oh, that's a motif, my friend. <laughs> that is the motif of the book of Genesis. You are to bless the earth and to cultivate it and to care for it. And you are to be a blessing. You are my people to be a blessing to many nations. That's the story when God makes the covenant with Abraham. And all of Abraham's descendants after him are supposed to do that. And when they start to do that, the theme that we see that comes over and over and over again is when they don't be a blessing to the people around them, things go terribly awry. And when they decide to finally be a blessing after they've been a jerk for so long, good things actually start to happen. And people get cared for. And, and the blessing just shows up. So now we get to watch Joseph live into that. Okay, where were we? I'm going to start in 35. Then let them gather. No, we read that one. 37. 36 and 37. And let the food become as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine, which shall occur in the land of Egypt, so that the land may not perish during the famine. Joseph is no longer just concerned about himself and how he will become a ruler. He is concerned about the people. Now, the proposal seemed good. <laughs> seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his servants. When Pharaoh saw this, it looked good. And that's not supposed to be a bad thing because it was a great suggestion, right? It is, a, it is a theme that we've seen before and we've seen it go well when God says something's good, God saw it and it looked good. Or it's really bad when Eve sees something and it's good and she takes it for herself. Now we're seeing that Joseph has taken care of what's been put into his hand and has offered a good suggestion to care for the people to cultivate the earth, to bless it, not just for himself, but for everybody else. Now he's living into this. And all of a sudden, to the king of Egypt, it looks good. This whole time, Israel's relationship with Egypt has been very strenuous all the way till now. Every time Abraham shows up in Egypt, they go away from there being like, this was not a good idea. Yeah, why did we ever go there? Now it's finally like, 
I'm so glad this guy is here. This is great. Okay, continue on. Then Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is the Ruach of God? You guys know this word, yes? Ruach? Sorry, I just went straight to the Hebrew because it's something I've heard Tim Mackey talk about way too many times. <laughs> the breath of the Spirit of God. That is what the word is right there in the Hebrew. It is a reference directly back to the first use of that was Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, when the Ruach of God was hovering over the waters. <laughs> R-U-A-C-H or, yeah, K-H, Ruach. Yeah? C-H, yeah, C-H, uh, your Blue Letter Bible is going to say K-H because that's how they pronounce it. Ruach. It's, it, if you can gargle in the back of your throat, you can say that word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? Isn't it? Su it's such a good word. Anyways, okay. Um, I don't agree with you on that one. In, in like where Egypt is. Yes. Oh, compared to Israel. Israel. Yes, yes. yes. But scorched by the east wind, so that's a bad thing. We don't want things to be scorched by the east. I would also point out that every reference to east that we have had through the course of Genesis has been a bad reference. Mm -hmm. So wind, yes. East wind, ye. Like that's a different use of the same hyperlink. Okay. Make sense? So, but that's, yes, there's, there's layers in there that, that I have not gotten to. Remember, I've listened to this and read this book like, like, upwards of like probably like 80 or 90 times because it, I love it that much. Like it's that good. There are still hyperlinks and like connections that I am like, I don't have the bandwidth to sort through this are connection. You able to like, when you've done it that much, are you able to actually see more than what you've already seen? Oh, heck yeah. So the first 15 times I listened and read through Genesis, I was like, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> Not gonna lie, that's what it felt like. When I got to the 20th time, things started to pop out. When I got to the 40th time, I'm like, I will never stop doing this ever again in my life. This is my favorite way to read the scriptures and it will never change. When I got to the 60th time, I was like, I should try doing this with a different book. When I got to the 80th time, I was like, nah, I just wanna stay here. But then I was like, no, I should go do this. So I did it with Matthew. And then I did it, now I'm doing it with Zechariah. It's by far and away like, what, when they say, you know, uh, blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor sit in the sea of scoffers, nor stand in the way of sinners, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Reading the same things over and over and over again and seeing how the internet connect, that is meditating on the law of the Lord day and night. We often think, I just want to be able to like read it and comprehend it once. If you read it and comprehend it once, it's great. There are a bazillion layers deeper as you read and reread and reread and reread the scriptures. It's why people like Ken Needham at, I don't even remember how long he's lived his life, still loves digging into the scriptures. He has incredible memory. Yeah. It's like I taught this 10 years ago, let me just tell it to you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, he's been around a while. But you notice that he seems like he loves the scriptures more than any of us. Why is that? Because he spent the time ruminating on it. Okay, let's continue to ruminate on this. We've got one minute left and we've got to read a whole bunch of verses. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has informed you of all this, there is no one so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house. Hey, wait, this is... What? And according to your command, all my people shall do homage. Only in the throne I will be greater than you. Oh, so then we went from Potiphar to Pharaoh. Well, to the jailer, to Pharaoh. Yes. Jailer, Pharaoh. Yes. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Okay. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. 
Then Pharaoh took off his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen. Wait, I feel like we've come full circle, have we not? Wait, so first Jacob gave him fancy clothes, and then his clothes were taken off of him, and then he was put in new clothes, and now he's put in really fine garments. Yes, Tricia. Well, it did. Yeah, let's keep going. And put the gold necklace around his neck. And he had him ride in his second chariot. And they proclaimed before him, Bow the knee. And he set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, yet without your permission, no one shall raise hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh named Joseph Zaphonath Paneah. Anybody? No? I didn't, yeah, I didn't know what it meant when I first read it either. And he gave him Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, the priest of On, as his wife. Not the same as Potiphar, but similar. And Joseph went forth over all the land of Egypt. Now Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt. Wait, he, we just, he just said that. Mmm, sounds like there's something in there. And during the seven years of plenty, the land broth, brought forth abundantly. There was a massive amount of blessing because Joseph finally did the right thing or just continued to do the right thing, right? So he gathered all the food of the seven years which occurred in the land of Egypt and placed the food in cities, and he placed every city in every city the food from its own surrounding fields. Thus Joseph stored up grain in great abundance like the sand of the sea. Sand until, of the sea. Sounds mm, clear. Until he stopped measuring it, for it was beyond measure. Now this is a hyperlink. This is a hyperlink. To two things. Yeah, sand of the sea and beyond measure. But then there's a hyperlink uh, forward to, is it Deuteronomy, when they talk about you will have kings, but you'll know your kings are getting into trouble when they start counting up their men and their wives and their power and their... Is that Deuteronomy? I think it's Deuteronomy. It's like Samuel. It's also like Samuel, but it's... Yes, there are layers to that one. Interesting, yes? Okay, we're not going to get the rest of this. We're out of time. There's also Psalms where you can't count the thoughts of God. That's going to be a hyperlink in a different direction, though. Okay, we're at verse 50. We have seven more verses to go. We'll start those tomorrow and see how far we get. Is that cool? Thoughts, questions, really quick? Yes. Hmm. It's that other really long chapter, chapter 24. Mm. Good hyperlinking. Good job. Thank you, friends. Let's pray, and then let's get out of here and get you a break before Ken comes back up. God, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. This has been such a delight. Would we continue to ruminate on these things as we go from here? In Jesus' name, amen. amen.